can find the zoo. Um, there's a hundred trillion synapses, synapses a connection between one brain cell and another one. So that's a lot, a hundred trillion. Um, that's a lot of, I think yeah, that's orders of magnitude more connections in human than even the, the biggest supercomputer that we uh, managed to create so far. Um, the, what is the storage capacity? If the brain were to what would the storage capacity be? It would be a quadrillion bytes or a petabyte uh, in computer right now, a petabyte of information. And the processing speed, our brains are massive parallel processors. They're uh, it's a single processor, it's not faster than a supercomputer, but um, because it's so massively parallel processing, it can do things extremely quickly. You can process an image. You know, think about all the information in an image, which is, you know, um, it, it's not 4K, it's closer to 10K you know, worth of visual data in 13 milliseconds. That's it. In 13 milliseconds, your brain can completely process an image. Um, and it's a hungry organ, right? So it, 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 your brain is actually using up a lot of energy. It uses up 20%, just sitting there thinking, using up 20% of your body's energy, just keeping your brain going along. Uh, that's why like, if your blood sugar gets a little low, you get a little tired, the first thing to shut down is your brain, right? If your brain doesn't have a constant supply of oxygen and glucose, you not only get sleepy, you can pass out. So that's just some basic stats about the brain. Um, but we're going to be talking about brain myths. Um, we're going to sort of walk you through the evolution of our understanding of the brain, because it, 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 sort of each step of the way, uh, the mythology about the brain was based upon our current misunderstanding, if you will, or our current best understanding of the brain. So, you know, understanding is kind of a false dichotomy. It's not that it we either understand the brain or we don't. The real question is how deeply do we understand the brain? Or how close is our sort of schematic? Right? We have to, you can't really wrap your head around all of the complexity of those hundred trillion synaptic connections. Right? Forget about it. But so you need to come up with some kind of basic schematic about how the brain works, or the different parts of the brain, and how they interact with each other. Uh, and through our evolution uh, of our you know, scientists' cutting edge understanding of the brain has evolved over the past few hundred years. And so, at each step of the way, there are lots of mythology based upon that current you know, schematic of our understanding of the brain. So, we're going to go back to the 18th century. Uh, and there, um, this is not long after they were pretty sure that the brain was the thinking part of the body, that that was, the part of the, that was sort of the master control. Um, the big debate at that time was, is the brain one big undifferentiated computing machine, right? Uh, or is it compartmentalized? So does one little piece of the brain do one specific thing, or does everything sort of everywhere in the brain? Um, and the side that was correct, that eventually won that debate, um, was the side that said that it's compartmentalized, right? There are different bits of the brain do different things different things. And interestingly, the, what we would consider to be pseudoscientists right, of the day, the phrenologists, were on the correct side of that debate. The phrenologists were basically the neuro, they were neuroscientists. Right? They were the neuroscientists of the brain's compartmentalized. So not only that, not only is the brain compartmentalized, um, that you could tell which part of the brain is more active or if it, more functional because it will be bigger, right? That means the muscles get bigger when you use them. Maybe the brain gets bigger when you use that part of the brain. So if there's one part of the brain involved in music and you're a musician, that part of the brain should be bigger. And how would we know that it's bigger without cutting open the head? Well, maybe the skull on top of that part of the brain will bulge to accommodate for the brain. So this is where you get to like reading the bumps on your skull. That's where that comes from. They think that you could you know, read the bumps on the human skull. They develop all kinds of elaborate machinery to like really carefully measure the different you know, physical measurements of the, of the skull. And then, and then they have an elaborate map of the underlying brain and what it did. And so they can read your personality and your strengths and weaknesses you know, based upon the bumps on your skull. Um, so while they were correct about the brain being compartmentalized, 
everything else in that chain of logic was completely wrong, right? So, first of all, I don't know how they came up with a map of the brain, but it has no basis in reality. Uh, it's really kind of fanciful. It's like it has the, the same relationship to the brain as sort of the flying machine pictures of the 1700s do to actual you know, planes today. Um, it was just quaint and, and, and silly from a modern perspective. Uh, and also, you know, the brain is squishy. The brain is like jello. You know, it kind of conforms to the skull. The skull does not conform to the brain, so that bit was wrong too. And the brain doesn't hypertrophy. It doesn't get physically bigger when you use it. Although the um, the cortical thickness will get you know, bigger for parts of the brain that you use a lot. So, like, if you do learn to play the violin when you're younger, and you keep that up for many, many years. The part of your brain that controls the hand that's doing all the work actually does get increased cortical thickness, right? But it doesn't, you can't see that from the outside and, and it wouldn't affect the skull in any case. So phrenology is, as it exists, and it still exists today, although well, it's definitely on the fringe. Um, they basically just do personality cold readings, you know, that's by reading your, your, the bumps on your skull. Um, but it has no basis in reality whatsoever. Um, but that was an important. Um, progress for neuroscience, right? So that we got started trying to understand how the brain works by figuring out, okay, so different parts of the brain do different things. So now we need to figure out what those things are and what those different parts of the brain are. And we figured that out um, over the 19th, now we're talking about the 19th century into early 20th century neuroscience. We figured that out mainly by doing what I do every day as a clinical problem. We examine patients who have part of their brain that is broken, right? And then you carefully document what their deficits are. Then you wait for them to die. You do an autopsy. You cut open the brain, and you see what part of the brain was damaged. And then, oh, I guess that part of the brain does whatever that thing was that the patient couldn't do. That was how we figured out how the different parts of the brain work. You can't speak. Oh, the, the left your temporal lobe is damaged, so that must be involved in speech. That's a pretty blunt way to look at how the brain works, but it was pretty good in terms of figuring out what the major regions of the brain are. You know, we know we have a language area, we have a motor area, a sensory area, a, part, a visual area, a part that moves the eyes, right? So the big regions of the brain and the big obvious functions that you can detect just by examining a patient and seeing what they can do and what they can't do, were sorted out pretty much by the early 20th century. Um, however, and that's kind of, to be honest with you, that's kind of, although it's a little bit more sophisticated today, that's still basically the schematic that clinical neurologists will use today. Even though we know it's a gross oversimplification, literally, right? And grossly <coughs> macroscopic. Um, but you can, like, I, I always tell our students and residents, you have to play this game, right? You get, when we see a patient, you decide where the lesion is before you look at the MRI scan of the brain. Right? Otherwise, you're practicing astrology. Right? Once you see the MRI scan, you can convince yourself, yes, that explains the patient's deficits. But if you say, okay, I think the lesion's going to be in this very specific place, and then you see the MRI scan and see if you're right or not. Right? So that's like a video game at that point. Is the feedback loop is very, very quick. You could learn to localize very accurately doing that. But now, let's get to a 21st century understanding localization and of how the brain is organized. It turns out it's a lot more complicated than that clinical schematic that we use. But now that we can start to look at networks in the brain, like a pattern of parts of the brain communicating with other parts of the brain and how they activate in real time a living person, they don't have to wait for you to die anymore and cut over your brain. We can look at the brain with functional MRI scanning or EEGs and use computers to like process that information in a very sophisticated way. And we're figuring out that all the schematics that we thought were pretty accurate are not that accurate, right? There's a lot more complexity going on in the brain. So now the debate is, um, we went from, is it differentiated or completely undifferentiated to, okay, it's differentiated and keep figuring out what the different parts do to then say, okay, but there are networks in the brain, right? So there's connections that span across the brain. So the question is, is the brain primarily organized as modules, right? A part of the brain that does a specific process, or networks, 
right, a distributed net network of connections from different parts of the brain. And the answer is, like so many times when we have a question like that, the answer is, it's both, right? The brain consists of networks of modules. Um, what do the modules do? That's a really good question. And we don't really know the answer to that. We know that modules, like when I say module, I mean a very specific anatomical structure within the brain. That it, it participates in different networks at different times for different tasks. So the same part of the brain may be doing one thing when it's engaging with one network and another thing when it's engaging with another network. So what is it doing? I don't know. It's, it's doing some kind of processing that can be used for multiple things. And, and it gets activated with certain tasks. So that's a very complicated thing to reverse engineer. But that's where we are right now, trying to you know, get more and more sophisticated schematics of the brain. And then we're also finding out that when, so oh yeah, the brokenness area is in the left frontal lobe, and that's what allows you to speak, right? But then we, then, so from all of our previous studies, that was the answer. Now we do fMRI scans, we go, oh crap, like all different parts of the brain are lighting up when somebody speaks. It's clearly not just brokenness area. That's obviously a core module involved in speech, but there's networks to different parts of the brain when we're speaking. So that's kind of where we are right now in terms of our understanding of the brain. Um, but we're going to back up again to a sort of early 20th century myth about the brain. This is a very easy one to start with, and that's the idea that we only use 10% of our brain. Right? How many people have heard of that, of that myth? Everybody. But pretty much everybody knows that it's bunk. Interesting, 20 years ago, like when I first started doing this, if you looked up on the, the web, sort of, it was just getting started, like the 10% of the brain, it was all gullible sites promoting it. Now if you do a Google search on it, it's all sites debunking the 10% myth, right? I think everyone knows, you know, that it's, it's nonsense. But where did it come from? I actually don't know exactly where it came from. But probably it comes from the notion that, and this is around the turn of the 20th century, around 1900, we had only mapped about 10% of the brain. Right? And I think some people, like journalists or whatever, got confused that we only mapped 10% of the brain to we only use 10% so like if you drew a map of the brain, it's like, you know, this does this, and this does this, and everything else we don't know, right? But they took that to mean it doesn't do anything. Um, of course, that's, that's you know, it, you know, it seems quaint and nonsensical, but it is interesting to think about how are we sure, how do we really know, like, how much of the brain we use, and what does that actually mean? Um, so, we don't use 100% of our brain, and that not every single neuron in the brain is being used. Um, at all or all the time. Most neurons, by the time you get to be an adult, most of the neurons in your brain are engaged in at least some networking, right? So by that, by that sense, we do use every cell in our brain. You do have some neural stem cells, a little bit of reserve that are there just to, for repair and plasticity and for rewiring and learning and new stuff, right? Um, so those aren't being used yet, but they're, they're sort of reserved to be used. Um, and there's also a pruning process that happens. So there's the, the human body, you know, biological systems largely work on the use it or lose it principle. Anything that these cells that are not actively functioning eventually get weaned away, get pruned away. So that's happening as well. So they, you know, pretty much everything that's left over by the time you're adult, you're using it, right? You're not using it all, all the time, obviously. You can't, your whole brain isn't lighting up at every moment. You're using different parts at different times. But we use it all. Um, you can make an evolutionary argument. Why would we have evolved in 90% of the brain tissue that we don't need? Um, you know, it makes no sense. And also a metabolic argument. We you know, use up 20% of our metabolism. That is a massive cost. That's a massive cost. Until you know, uh, industrialized nations in the 20th and later century, we, you know, human civilization population was limited by our caloric intake. Um, you know, it would be massively wasteful to have you know, part of your body using a 20% of its metabolism it wasn't all really, really useful. You, that's why, by the way, New Zealand has a lot of flightless birds. Whenever birds don't have to fly to survive, they, they lose the ability to flight because flight is massively uh, calorically intense. You have to, it has to be worth it. The moment it's not worth it anymore, you just lose your ability. Um, okay. 
still on this theme, sort of the first half of my talk is this theme of the networks and modules, like how the brain is organized and myths around that. Um, so here's one that I think is, is the 10%, everyone knows the 10% of the brain myth is nonsense, but how about the left brain, right brain thing? How many people have heard that, oh, I'm left brained or I'm right brained or you take a personality test and that's all bullshit, right? Just out of the gate, it's all nonsense. The people, we have one brain, right? And the brain is massively, we have two hemispheres. We do have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. And it is true that each hemisphere is capable of being conscious all by itself. You need about 45% of your cortex and you need your brain stem. If you have those two things working, you can be wakefully conscious, right? If you ever f lose one or the other, more than 55% of your cortex or anywhere, or um, your, your brain stem function, you will be in a coma, right? Um, however, uh, you, the, the two hemispheres function as one whole. Um, the, uh, the networks, remember we, talk, we talked about modules and networks, those networks are not all on one side of the brain. The networks are going all across the brain. So everything your brain does is using both hemispheres at the same time. Right? Even when I, I used Broca's area, which is sort of the dominant, usually left frontal lobe involved in speech, well, there's, the opposite side of the brain is lighting up when we speak too. There's different things um, that are involved in any you know, complex kind of cognitive task that we do. Um, so it's just the idea that the left brain is analytical and the right brain is creative it has no basis in reality at all. And everyone is both right and left brain at the same time. And you can't even localize something like creativity to one or the other hemisphere. The only things that localize that well are like the really basic physical functions. Like moving my right arm, yes, that localizes to my left hemisphere, absolutely. But creativity, memory, and, you know, and analytical thinking, no. Plus, here's the other thing. Most of the really higher cortical stuff, the stuff that separates us from, from other primates, it's all in the frontal lobes, and it's all what we call bilaterally redundant, meaning that it's on both sides of the brain, and they, you know, they can function all by themselves. So all of your personality, all of that stuff is bilateral. It doesn't lateralize to one side or the other. So any left brain, right brain stuff, just get rid of that. That's complete nonsense. Um, all right, here's another interesting question. Uh, are there differences between the male and female brain? That's a, that's a very, I'm not going to tell you necessarily what the answer is, but how many people think that there is important, provable um, differences between uh, you know, typical male, typical female. How many would say, yeah, there's probably some differences in there? A lot of people reluctantly say, like, <laughs> a lot of half hands going up. No one wants to sort of put their nickel down on that. All right, so it's, it's a complicated question. It depends on what you mean by differences. So I think um, the short answer is not in the way most people think. So if you look at the anatomy of the brain, of the anatomy of the brain, um, there are some statistical differences between male and female brains. And they're not anything that you would predict or that necessarily flows from typical cultural constructs of male-female. Um, female brains, statistically on average, have slightly thicker cortical uh, regions, cortical rims. Male brains are slightly larger overall. So men have bigger brains, but women have thicker cortices. Um, but if you control for size, like really well, um, those differences become really small, right? So just that men are bigger than women, and that, that artifact changes this, these statistics because brain size changes with body size, but not in a clean, linear way. And so you have to like really map out how body and brain size are related, and when you really accommodate for that, the differences shrink down to negligible. But they're still there statistically, although they don't correlate with anything, right? So IQ or any performance or whatever, they, they don't really mean anything. But here's the other thing, is that if you, um, the, the overlap is far greater than the statistical difference, 
right? So if two, you have two groups and they're just slightly apart, you can, if you look at enough data, you can make a statistically significant difference. But the variation within each group is far greater than the statistical difference between the two groups. Um, now more recently, so that's just looking at anatomy. So yeah, there's statistical differences. They're, not, they're pretty small when you properly control for and they don't really mean anything. And there's, they're much smaller than the variance within the, the gender. But now, now we have the ability to look at the networks, right? We could look at not only the, just the gross anatomy of the brain, just how thick things are and how big things are. We can say, let's look at the networks in the brain, the connectome, right? The connections, the pattern of connections in the brain. If we look at males and females, are there differences in the networks, right? Are men from you know, Mars and women from Venus? Is there any reality to that? And it turns out it's the same thing, where um, if you look at them across the board, what you find is that, okay, most of them there's no difference. There's some networks where there's a statistical differences between men and women, but it's much smaller than the variance you know, within, within the gender. So I think the bottom line is, um, if you, we're able to examine a brain with all of our technology in every way possible, you would not be able to tell if it were a male or female brain. You wouldn't be able to tell. Because it, it'll be within the variance of both. It's, it's very much like height. Yeah, men are statistically taller than women. But if you, all you knew about somebody was their height, could you guess if they were, a, no, you wouldn't have no idea if they were a, you know, a male or, or a female. You wouldn't know. So, the difference is, here's the other one, one final comment on this, because this is still a raging controversy within neuroscience, even though the data is pretty much moving very strongly in the direction that I just summarized for you. There's a lot of studies showing differences between male and female brains, but they tend to go away with replication. They don't, they have a history of not replicating well, meaning they're usually a result of flawed statistical analysis and small sample size, and then once you, once you get through the process of doing more and more rigorous and larger studies, the effect sizes all tend to go away. Um, so that, that's been the history over the last 50 years or so of this question. So at this point, the consensus is, yeah, there's, if there are differences, there's not much, and it's, and it's not really amounting to anything. Okay. Um, I'm going to shift gears to uh, another kind of, kind of mythology of the brain. Um, and this is more, so that was sort of the anatomy, the networking module part. Now we're going to talk about hacking the brain, right? That's become a, a popular term, so I'm going to hack the brain. The basic idea of hacking your brain is that you're going to do something, right? You're going to do something special that is going to cause your brain to change above and beyond just the normal process of learning, memory, training, practice, right? The hard work of getting better at something or knowing something. Um, but we're gonna make you smarter, better, faster just by doing this one trick, right? Like, the, like you always see like kind of the clickbait on, online. And we're gonna hack into your brain and make it work better. Um, Spoiler, you know, it's all nonsense, right? Just that whole concept is nonsense. But I'm gonna go through some specific manifestations of it. I'm gonna go back to the 1960s. Again, sort of talk historically about our understanding of, of biology and the brain at that time. So at that time, there was a viable theory that was actually part of mainstream science called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Anyone ever hear of that phrase? So, what that means is that as we develop from an embryo to a newborn, we pass through stages that mimic our evolution from you know, fish to amphibians to mammals to primates to humans. So we're sort of passing through our, developmentally passing through our evolutionary stages. That was a real theory back in the 1960s, you know, into the 1970s. And, but it was utterly disproven. You know, scientists explored it, and it was like, no, that's not right. It's just that's not correct. Um, you you pass through embryonic stages, but they don't develop into adult stages of previous forms, right? It's more like if you can imagine like a developmental pathway. It's like fish break off here, and then you know. So yeah, you're all passing through 
stages that are similar, like if you look at an embryo from a chimpanzee and a human, they're pretty much indistinguishable. Like at some point during the developmental pathway, things start to separate. But we don't become an adult chimpanzee before we become an adult human. We didn't evolve from chimpanzees anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Like we don't become a monkey before we become a human. It just doesn't work that way. We don't become a fish and then become a mammal. You know? It doesn't work that way. So the idea was completely discarded. However, before it was discarded, there were two neuroscientists, Doman and Delicato, who said, we're going to exploit this principle in order to help children who are developmentally delayed develop, right? So we'll take children who, like at the time, you would call them mentally retarded. You know, we would probably use the term more developmental de delay at this time. And we'll say, so the problem is they haven't progressed through all the stages. So we're going to help them progress through all of these stages. Um, so that means you have to crawl before you walk, right? So the, in order to get the kids to walk, we're going to teach them how to crawl. Um, but if they can't crawl on their own, that's okay. We'll crawl for them, right? So the Doman Telecado technique is a, it's called psychomotor patterning. And again, the, that phrase says it all. You're gonna, we're going to impose these patterns on the brain by just passively moving the child through the developmental stages. So, um, for example, you may have four adults, one on each limb of an infant, sort of moving their arms and turning their head in a crawling motion, and do that for five hours a day. And if you do that for a couple of years, this is, what, this is serious commitment, then you will cure your child of whatever their developmentally delay is. This is one of the most exploitative and cruel pseudosciences I've ever encountered. And um, by coincidence, you know, in, in the previous house that my wife and I lived in, our next door neighbors were doing this to their child who had Down syndrome. It was really, really sad. Um, and they're like convinced this is gonna cure them. You know? Now of course, if you take a child at one or two, and then you reevaluate them at three and four, they developed, right? They're going to be more functional than they were. It's developmental delay, you know, not stop. And so any normal improvement that children experience just because they're getting older, they will interpret that as, we'll see it's working, right? So if you want to convince yourself that it's working, you can convince yourself that it's working. And if it doesn't work, you know why it doesn't work? They didn't work hard enough. They didn't, put, you know, they didn't put in those six hours a day or whatever. It's really cruel. Like it turns entire f extended families upside down on this false hope that they're going to impose this developmental pattern on the brain based upon 50-year-old outdated concepts. Um, just really just pseudoscience to the core. Still exists. The Doman Delicato Institute still exists. They're still doing this to parents. They've incorporated some other pseudosciences like breathing techniques or whatever. It's all crap. Um, but there's a more popular version of this that's the same basic idea, and that is neurofeedback. Now, how many people have heard about neurofeedback? How many of you think it's legitimate? What happens? <laughs> um, that's okay. We're all, fit. We're all friends here. It's a safe space. So, I mean, so the... As is often the case, I mean, psychomotor patterning is 100% bullshit. Neurofeedback, you know, there are some legitimate aspects to it. And if you're using it as a way of teaching you self-relaxation techniques, fine. That's fine. But th here's where the pseudoscience comes in, because there's always, someone's always going to lather on a layer of pseudoscience, right? The pseudoscience comes in saying that, all right, we're going to teach you how to change your EEG, right? Your electroencephalogram, your brain waves. We're gonna train your brain waves, and then that's gonna change your brain, right? So, for example, if you, um, the brain waves have different rhythms, you know, alpha, beta, theta, delta rhythm. Delta's like deep sleep, theta is drowsy, alpha is alert, calm, and awake. Um, so we say if your alpha rhythm is when you're awake, alert and calm, right, and relaxed. So if we could get your EEG to look like an alpha rhythm, you will be calm and relaxed. But that's kind of reversing the arrow of cause and effect. It doesn't work that way. 
You know, you can't just, it's like painting a mountain green and saying, oh, it's green. No, it's still not full of trees, right? So just somehow making you have alpha rhythms does not in any way change your brain. It's just, it's reflecting your brain's state at any given moment, that's it. But there's an entire industry based around reversing this cause and effect from EEGs to the brain function rather than the, you know, the other way around. You can get you know, recordings to listen to. I mean, I've had patients where the family would come in and put earphones, they're in a coma, right? Patients are in a coma, the family puts earphones on them and they're playing these weird sounds. It's gonna somehow affect the brain to recover. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you know, you, you, you can't just force the brain to recovery, hack into the brain by trying to, you know, do things that manipulate the EEG or whatever. But that's still a very, very active pseudoscience. You'll see, you'll see versions of that all the time. Um, how many people here have heard of super brain yoga? Super brain yoga. It's common in the UK. I think that's where it's, that's the center point of it and then sort of spread out to other English speaking countries. I guess it's not very, how many kids here have kids in school? You may have, have heard of it because that's where it's made most of its um, invasion. So super brain yoga is this, right? You touch your earlobes and then <laughs> I'm doing super brain yoga right now. It's going to wake up my brain. Why do you have to cross the earlobes? Again, it's like it's ridiculous when you like really strip it down. But so that way, I'm connecting the right side of my brain to the left side of my brain. That's it. That's that's, and then you're doing physical activity, and it's going to wake your brain up. And so, okay, yeah, physical activity in the morning is a good way to sort of get your body going and to and to become more alert, sure. But the whole, like again, they go beyond just doing morning calisthenics to hacking into the brain with this little trick that's gonna do some weird thing that's gonna connect your right brain and your left brain and integrate things more. It's, it's all nonsense. There's no basis in, you know, in functional neurology. But there is a company promoting this and they are very successful at um, going into schools, you know, and getting entire schools of kids to do this stupid super brain yoga exercises in the morning. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You can go online on YouTube and watch videos of people doing it. It's like just that, it's just, it becomes magic at some point. All right, so you may not have heard of super brain yoga, but you probably have heard of Lumosity, right? Has anyone here ever used any of the, the brain training games from Lumosity? Um, so the idea is, this is similar, this is a hacking the brain thing, but in this case, hacking the brain is often referred to as brain training, right? We're going to train your brain, otherwise known as learning, right? <laughs> what is, what's the difference between learning and brain training? Uh, or, or just memory, right? Or, you know, practice, you know? So the idea is that you're going to make your brain function better. You're going to make your brain smarter. I love it. They always say scientifically designed games. I wonder who those scientists were. Because there that can't be true because there is no science upon which to design a game that would do anything other than making you better at that game. That's what they do. So here's the legitimate question, right? So and this has been researched because it's a legitimate question. What, how transferable or generalizable are skills that you developed, that you developed, you know, learning to do one task, right? How transferable are they? So if you do word puzzles, right, you do one specific type of word puzzle, do you get better at all word puzzles? Do you get better at all puzzles? Does your memory get better? Does your ability to process information get better? How transferable does that get? Um, and it, you know, it's not crazy to think that if I do lots of word games, I get good at word games. You know, and maybe I get good at just some generic things like focusing my attention and being able to, you know, so there are some pretty generic skills that you think may come out of that. It's not a crazy idea. Um, but now we have 20, 30 years of research that we can use to answer that question. And the question is, not much. Which is unfortunate. It would be nice if I could play Sudoku and get smarter. You know, who can, yeah, it'd be great. 
Um, it turns out if you play Sudoku, you get better at playing Sudoku. And that's just about it. Like, there's almost no transferability. Um, you may get slightly better at very similar games. That's it. Um, there's no study which shows that there's anything you could do that will make you generically smarter, whatever that means, right? In, by any operationally defined and measurable way. It doesn't make your memory better, it doesn't make you more, you know, able to problem solve better or anything like that. It just, you get better at the things, the specific thing that you do, maybe closely related uh, games. But this is still an active area of research. I'm giving you a very broad brushstroke summary. I think that's basically true. It's true enough that Lumosity got sued and the, uh, at least I think it was the FCC, forced them to recant all of their claims. Like, these will make you smarter. Nope, you cannot say that. The evidence absolutely does not support that. Now, there may be some exceptions. Um, it does seem that if you do tasks which involve a lot of three-dimensional visual spatial processing, that you get better at three-dimensional visual processing. And, for example, um, surgeons who operate using um, scopes, like they, they, they're doing endoscopic, so they put a little camera into your what body part, and whether it's a joint or your abdomen or whatever, and then they are operating through a little camera. They get a little better if they play video games that involve similar visual processing. So that one kind of makes sense. You're getting better at visual processing, and that visual processing can make you a little bit better at a task that requires that exact same kind of visual processing. So okay, that, the evidence seems to show that. That's fine. Um, and you know, there are some generic skills that you think, you know, it's always better to do stuff rather than not do stuff. I mean, I think like all of, you know, a lot of physical therapy and other, any, all, any kind of, any therapy, right? Anything therapy basically comes down to it's better to do stuff than not do stuff. You know, if you're physically active, you're going to be physically healthier. If you're mentally active, you're going to be mentally healthier. That's about all we could say. There really isn't anything special about any kind of physical activity or any kind of mental activity. You all just get better at whatever it is that you do. Does that make sense? All right. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, all right. Another brain hacking thing, this one on the psychiatry end of the spectrum. Um, psych psychology, psychiatry, unfortunately, is just rife with pseudoscience. Um, not because they're not good scientists. I think it's because um, the outcomes are a little bit more squishy. You know, it's a little bit harder to, to measure the outcome. And there's a lot of non-specific effects going on in the therapeutic relationship. And it's perfectly legitimate to leverage all of those therapeutic, generic, you know, benefits. So it, it seems, again, broad brushstroke, um, if the thing that matters most in terms of any therapy is just the skill of the therapist. That if a therapist has good um, uh, talent and skill, good intuition, they develop a good relationship with their client, they know how to listen and to think about it, it doesn't matter what they do. It just doesn't matter. Anything that they do will work because it's really the therapeutic dynamic between the therapist and the client that is having 95% or whatever of the benefit. So because of that, anything you study will seem to work when it comes to therapy. So how do we separate out the specific things that you're doing from the non-specific effects of the therapeutic relationship? It's really tricky. You know, there's also another generic effect, and that is when you take any established therapeutic relationship and you introduce a novel element. Hey, we're going to try this new thing. That has an effect. People get better just because, they're like, oh, we're going to try this new thing. That's kind of like the Hawthorne effect. You guys remember that? Where they did the studies where they raised the light levels in the factory and people got more productive, then they lowered the light levels and people got more productive. And, you know, so it turns out that this is, there's a layer of complexity here I'm not going to have time to get into, but the bottom line is there's an observer effect where if you do something, then people know that they're being observed, 
that they may change their behavior. So no matter what change they made, as long as it didn't practically limit their ability to function, people got better. So it's the same kind of thing in therapeutic relationships. Anything, anything, anything you do will have a benefit. It's just the fact that you're doing something, that you're trying to help the client. Okay. So th this has sort of generated an endless stream of brain hacking, superficial nonsense that gets layered over the therapeutic relationship. And the one that I think has gone, has gained the most acceptance within mainstream psychology is EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Sounds very technical and neurosciencey. EMDR, what does that mean? So it means you do your therapy, whatever it is that you're doing, cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure therapy. It's, it's very frequently used for people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And you basically do exposure therapy, which means that you expose them in a safe place to the thing that triggers their PTSD. And then you sh they learn that it's okay, that they're safe, and that nothing bad happens. And so they sort of decouple the anxiety and the fear and everything from the trigger, right? That's basically the idea of exposure therapy. And it works, it works fine. So EMDR is doing that, plus you do some other nonsense that has no effect, right? It's what I call the part of this nutritious breakfast approach. You guys ever see those commercials? It's like Pop-Tarts, part of this nutritious breakfast, right? It's an irrelevant part, but if you eat it with all the nutritious stuff, it, it could be a part of it. It just has no added nutritional value by itself. So there's a lot of that in therapy. It's like part of this effective therapy, but it's an irrelevant part. So all right, so what is it? Um, it's basically moving your eyes back and forth while you think about your trauma, right? That's it. And by moving the eye, what's, what's, so what's happening? Well, that's hacking into the brain and causing your neurons to reprocess the, it's not doing any of that. They have all this fancy explanation that sounds all you know, neuroscience-y about what's happening in the brain. It's all fake brain hacking nonsense. Nothing is happening except that you're doing exposure therapy and then you're moving your eyes back and forth. And maybe you get a little excited because there's, we're introducing this novel thing that's gonna hack into your brain and work. Um, but there's other things too, like tapping therapy, like oh, I'm gonna tap on you while you think about your, and it doesn't, all of that is just the, the layer of unnecessary nonsense on top of the real therapy which is happening in the background. But of course, if you study EMDR in a sloppy you know, trial, it works you know, because the exposure therapy is working. So how do you control, you have to do a carefully controlled trial where you're introducing a novel element to establish therapy as a control and you're introducing EMDR and you want to see does EMDR do better than some crap you just made up, which shouldn't work by any theoretical mechanism. And when you do that, there's no, there's no difference. But of course they just say, well, that thing works too. I just invented a new, my control group is a new therapy. Because of course everything works. Um, okay, the final big category I'm gonna talk about is the, the, one of the biggest and most persistent myths of brain function, and that is that consciousness is in some way a thing, right? A, something that's different than or other than just the firing of your neurons in your brain. And this is sort of a dualistic notion, right? That consciousness, the mind is somehow a thing unto itself, and that you're like, you are inside your body. You're not inside your body, you are your body. Right? But we feel like we're inside our body. And it's not um, surprising that we feel that way intuitively, because that's how our brains are wired. Our brains are wired to create the illusion that we are inside our bodies. And when that part of the brain is turned off, what happens? You have an out-of-body experience. You could actually feel like you are separated from your body. Because feeling like you're inside your body is not an automatic thing. It's an active process your brain has to do. And so we have a lot of intuitions. We have an intuition about the fact that we're separate from our bodies, you know, even though we're inside of them, we're separate from the universe. Of an essence, we have this sort of super sense of an essence that there is something that is intrinsically me or intrinsically you or intrinsically, you know, like dogs have an essence of what dogness is. And that that essence can somehow be transferred um, 
So there's a lot of this in fiction and science fiction that we sort of, yeah, we know it's science fiction, we know it's not real, this specific example, but we don't necessarily question the premise. So I like, so a few examples I thought of, like one is Freaky Friday, right? You, know, you guys know that, where the daughter and the mother switch places. But there's a lot of fiction based upon that idea that like, your consciousness is going to be placed in another body. That can't even theoretically work because your consciousness isn't even a thing that can be you know, in a different body. It is your body. So that it doesn't, it, conceptually it doesn't even work. Um, even in Star Trek, the original series, you guys, if you any fans out there, um, when in the episode where the, this ancient powerful race, their consciousnesses are held in these spherical orbs, these glowing orbs, right? And then they have to borrow the bodies of the crew, so like Sargon is in Kirk's body, and Kirk's consciousness is in the orb while he's there. Again, we sort of took that for granted as, you know, it's an advanced technology, we know it's not a real thing today, but the basic concept doesn't work, right? Um, and then, okay, so probably the most, a very recent example was Avatar, the movie Avatar. Remember at the end of the movie where he transfers, flows through the tree into the other body? So what, what's happening there? You know, the, he, he's dead. And the best you could say is he's dead and a backup copy of his brain patterns are now in a different body and a different brain. And that copy probably feels like the, the real person. But nothing was transferred. It was just copied, is the best you could say. And so along those lines is the notion of uploading your consciousness, right? Who here has heard of that concept? It, when once we develop computers that are powerful enough, you could upload your consciousness into a digital format, into a robot, into an artificial intelligence. No. That's never going to happen, because it fundamentally can't happen. At best, you can make a copy of the information in your brain and represent it in a different medium. And it's not you, and it's not even your brain, it's just a digitization of information that was translated from the information in your brain. But nothing, there's no consciousness that's moving or uploading or going somewhere else, right? If you did it and then you died, you're dead, right? Max Headroom, Remember Max I remember my dating myself too much yet? It's not, it was a copy. It was a digital copy of the original guy, right? It wasn't, nothing moved. So just this idea of uploading your consciousness, I think is sort of maybe one of the last brain myths, you know, that are out there um, that is a false hope. It's just not anything that can possibly happen. Um, so that's it. I don't know how much time I have left over for questions, but um, for whatever time I have left, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Ten minutes, perfect. Thank you. Fascinating talk. In 1973, David and Rosenhan did the famous experiment that showed that psychiatrists really don't know what they're talking about. Has anything changed since then, other than uh, perhaps better drugs? So when, how long ago was that, remind me? 1973, David Rosenhan. Oh yeah, 73. A lot has changed since then. So. Um, you know, psychiatry is, is very challenging because, again, we're dealing with outcomes that are um, hard to measure objectively. Uh, but also, um, the, you know, we, we have to develop what we call constructs, right? So a construct is, a, is a, con a conception of how the brain works at its most fundamental level. Um, and what we don't know is if we've gotten down to bedrock yet. So we know there are things like anxiety is a thing, right? Anxiety is definitely a phenomenon of the brain. There are anxiety circuits in your brain. When that circuit's firing, you are anxious. It has a very, you know, that's a, one of the most simplest constructs, psychiatric constructs that we have in neuroscience that holds up pretty well, no matter how we look at it. And it's also, you know, one of the things that's easiest to diagnose, easiest to treat, because it's pretty basic. But then there are other things like obsessive compulsive disorder or you know, like schizophrenia, um, which these are definitely things. We just don't know if they're fundamental things. 
Um, in fact, a few years ago, the director of the NIMH, that's the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, made the statement that, you know, I think that the lack of progress in psychiatric research may be coming from the fact that we're requiring, like for any study, you have to tie it to a, a DSM diagnosis, right? So a clinical diagnosis. And they said, maybe we should abandon that because we're sort of locking ourselves in to these constructs which may not be fundamental. And therefore, we're thinking about it in a superficial way. Like schizophrenia may just be what, how we perceive a whole bunch of different things that are happening at a much deeper level. And that's certainly true to some extent. Um, and so that, that's why when we ask questions like what's happening in the brain of a schizophrenic versus somebody who's not schizophrenic, and lots of things are happening, in, but only in like 40, 50, 60 percent of people who meet the clinical diagnosis. So what does that mean? Do they have different things going on that just look the same? And we see this to a, a simpler degree in neuro neuroscience, like for example, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, motor neuron disease. It's not a disease. It's a clinical syndrome that is defined by the cells that are dying, right? But, whatever, but there could be a dozen or 20 different reasons why those cells are not functioning. So it's 20 diseases that look clinically the same. So now we add several orders of magnitude complexity to that. And we're going back to the modules and the networks. So what's the network that's misfiring in somebody who has obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever? Is it just one? Maybe there's a dozen different networks that could be misfiring in a different ways that are resulting in a clinical picture that superficially looks similar. And we call that clinical picture obsessive compulsive disorder. But if we really knew what was going on in the brain, it may have some, you know, it may be completely different things. So, but again, don't fall for the black and white. We either understand or we don't understand. That's not how understanding works. It's really, think about it in terms of how deep is our understanding. We have a pretty deep understanding, I think, of mental illness, at least to a clinical level, where we could talk about clinical manifestations and at least research and follow some out, meaningful outcomes that are, you know, mean something in people's lives. Um, in terms of basic science research of understanding exactly what's going on in the brain in those clinical syndromes, that's where we are right now is researching that and that's where we, we, we know that we, we're, we are not close to, pay, you know, to, to, um, to ground level at this point. So, but don't confuse like not knowing the ultimate you know, neuroanatomical correlates to we don't know anything. We know a lot, and we know enough to know that there's a lot we don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Um, in the history of uh, evolution, um, particularly hominids, but you know, all evolution, brain size is one of the key variables that people are looking at, and you know, they trace, say, from Austro. Um, <laughs> Sort of pithy scenes to yeah. few minutes, and also you know where did consciousness consciousness develop along that path? But it seems in modern sort of uh, science that brain size is not a factor in intelligence, or you know you can lose forty five percent of your brain and it doesn't really matter. So how do you reconcile those two things? Um, that's a really good question. So the, you know, the, the so first of all, this whole idea that you could lose forty five percent of your brain it doesn't matter is not true, right? You could be conscious but you absolutely take an intellectual hit, right? So we have lots of patients who, like, we have to take out half their brain because they have seizures or whatever. Yeah, they could be, you know, they could have an IQ of 80 or 90 and they can get by, but you're not going to be a genius with half a brain because you have there's half as many neurons able to form networks. So don't think that you're totally fine with half a brain. You're not. Um, but the, there is a more complicated relationship between brain size and um, intelligence. You know, in using that, I know that's a problematic word because it's hard to define specifically, but we'll just use it in a gen general sense. Um, when you're, and I think it's a matter of scale, right? If you're comparing, you know, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, yeah, there's big differences in brain size and probably big differences in intellectual capability as well. But now you're talking about within a species, the differences in brain size are due to differences in just people size, you know, just the size of the person. And that 
overwhelms any difference, you know, in, that is a result of being more intelligent. Plus, there's things other than just sheer size that affects intelligence. So again, using that in a very vague way. There is cortical thickness, right? So just the part of the brain that where all the cells are. So the overall brain may be big, um, but it doesn't help you unless you it's more of the, the brain cell. Like for example, like dolphin brains are huge, but it's mostly white matter. You know, they have lots of, of processing of the wires for the sonar processing and things like that, but they don't necessarily have really big cortices. So you have to know what the relationship there is. And then there's also the networking density. Uh, we talked on our show recently, I said recently, it might have been a year ago, about studies looking at comparing different animals based upon the, basically how sophisticated their networks are inside their brain. And it turns out like raccoons are almost as smart as primates. Dogs are a lot smarter than cats. Probably has a lot to do with um, their socialization, but also just their problem solving. Uh, Corvids, you know, very smart. So brain size is not everything. It isn't everything. It's, there's a, a complicated relationship between brain and body size, but you also have to know what their neuronal density is, and you have to know what their cortical thickness is. And again, when, you, when you're looking at within a species, those other variables are just bigger than just raw brain size. Okay, last question. Yeah. Is that working? Yep. Uh, my question is, can we slow down the degradation of our brain by using it and exercising it? That's kind of the first part. And if the answer is yes, what should we be doing? What sorts of things should we be exercising our brain by doing? Yeah, so I think the short answer is we don't know. Um, but there is, because again, it depends on what, what you're looking at and, and um, how are you defining it. So again, it's, I think that it's pretty reasonable to say, again, it's better to do stuff than not do stuff. And if you, if you look at people who are mentally active, they do seem to have some protective effect against progressive dementia. But we don't know if that's just because they have farther to fall. And, you know what I mean? So the, the higher you are at your baseline functioning, the farther you gotta go before you qualify for a diagnosis of dementia. So that could look like a protective effect, but it may just be that you have more reserve, right? So that doesn't mean it's not a good idea, but so I think you should, you know, generally we say yes, you're, you're better off being mentally active and it will protect you. We don't know what the mechanism of that protection is. Again, it may just be you're building up more reserve. It's kind of like build up your bone density by 50 because then you're coasting to the grave on whatever bones you got from that point forward. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and then what, what helps, so again, there's no specific thing, mental or cognitive task that seems to be better, generically speaking, than any other. With this possible exception, and again, I say possible because we're kind of at the beginning of this research, and that is, it seems to be more stimulating to the brain to do new and novel things than things that you've already done most of your life. So, I think this is a fun and interesting thing to do anyway, but if you want to, you know, do everything you can based upon our current understanding, um, it's, the research suggests that if you just do something you've never done before, learn a second language, pick up a musical instrument, start doing crossword puzzles, do anything like that, seems to be more stimulating than just doing the same things over and over again. And what the mechanism of protection, or if it's really protecting you is not really clear, but it might. Um, and it does seem to, you know, to help overall cognition to, to begin be mentally engaged versus not being mentally engaged. So. That's not, I can't give you a more definitive answer, but that's, that's what we, the best that we know right now. Great, okay. Um, join me in thanking um, Steve, and then we'll have coffee. Thank you. Thank you.